Shout out KW. Hello and welcome to SyrupCast, the definitive podcast for all your mobile needs. This week, on the last day of July, we contemplate the future of wireless in Canada. And what is wireless exactly? Less and less of our content is taken up by what we refer to as traditional mobile products. Instead, we fill the proverbial pages of our days with wearables like Thalmix Mayo Gesture Band, Oculus Rift's new virtual reality headset, Samsung's myriad smartwatches, lights, speakers, and routers that all communicate with our smartphones. And yet, as we go further away from the core mobile, we always end up back at the beginning. The smartphone really is the center of our digital world, and increasingly at the expense of other products, like tablets. In our tete-a-tete this week, Douglas and I talk about whether affordable phablets are going to be the death of the tablet category, or whether they are just going to morph into a single product. So this week, we're going to talk about all that, the affordable phablet, and how companies like Alcatel OneTouch and Huawei and Oppo and OnePlus and others are, mel- are meeting swift blows on the traditional subsidized smartphone business model. And from there, we'll talk about mobile plan pricing, because we've been dancing around the subject for weeks, and we really just want to rant. So, Douglas, how are you, sir? I'm I'm ready to pod, sir. You're ready to pod. You listened to my. Uh, you you did you did not you did not like that intro. I I, I know. I'm I'm I going all. I read along I'm, with it. <laughs> I'm going all Giango Meshi on you guys, but. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy a good monologue. What can I say? It was a little cute. I'll give you that. It was cute Thank, Thank you. Yeah, I don't look like Giango Meshi, but uh, I'm working on it. So let's let's start today. Um, first of all, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, and last week we promised 45 minutes, and we literally went double that. Uh, so on our sixth podcast, we're we actually fired Jane. Talk- yeah, we're, we're done with Jane. Jane is far too... Uh, Far too talkative. No, no. Jane is uh, lovely, but she is actually on a well-needed vacation after only one week of work, because that's how we do at Mobile Syrup. Uh, but this week uh, we're gonna we're gonna focus. We're gonna talk about Thalmic because Thalmic uh, has announced that they have fulfilled forty thousand pre-orders of their um, of the final production unit of their gesture band, and our own Tom Emmerich had a hands-on with uh, this amazing wearable that's. Uh, whose company is based out of uh, Waterloo? So let's uh, let's talk about it. What what do you think? I mean, is this is this product uh, as big? Does it have the potential to be as big as uh, as everybody says? Yes, and I actually think it's maybe a little underestimated because while something like uh, Oculus Rift gets a lot of press because it's um, admittedly uh, very fanciful. Um, this is this is the kind of the the wearable tech, the next gen tech that just seems like it could be so prevalent in day to day use for like just so many uh, business cases. So I, I think the notable thing as well is that it's not only just forty thousand pre orders, but that they're they're shipping now. So like this is like this is a tangible um, version one finished project uh, product that that is now being shipped to devs. So it's it's it, it's exciting hardware and ex- an exciting moment for them to see some so much buy-in or interest in in what they're doing. So yeah, and also just a uh, shout outs to the Kitchener Waterloo region. Um, I'm not sure if they're actually in Waterloo, so we got to extend it to the the broader KW for all my for all my peeps there. My bad. I I don't know very much about KW other than visiting the Blackberry campus a few times. So. Uh, if you are listening in uh, in the KW, we do appreciate it, um, and I, I acknowledge that they are very separate and different places, um, but uh, are are one big happy community. I hope. So, if you haven't seen the Mayo hands-on by Tom Emmerich, uh, he visited last week uh, when they announced that pre-order, uh, and 
I think if you haven't seen it, you, you're going to be really impressed because basically what it is, it's a band that you wear on your arm, and it allows you to interact with any screen that basically the developer has has connected to. So um, Thalmic has created a bunch of APIs that uh, can tie into mobile uh, or PC. Uh, right now it's optimized for laptops like OS X and Windows, and you basically move your arm around and you perform functions, like you create actions, and this has the potential to be used for gaming, for presentations, for sports, virtual sports, whatever whatever you want to do with it, it's possible. But more, moreover, it, it introduces a new input method, input method that has really never been used before, and that's muscular, um, basically the, the, the fine motor movements uh, of your muscles and tendons. Yeah, so, so I guess one way to put this is like unlike Xbox Connect, which kind of uh, films and records uh, your limbs and body in relation to other parts to figure out movement, this can actually measure the contraction of individual uh, muscle groups in your arm. So you don't necessarily have to move your arm so much as even clench it for, for things to happen. So it's like they took all the cool parts of the power glove and then sucked out the 80s rad and then you have the Thalmix option. Awesome. Although Power Glove was great uh, in, in its own way, but uh, clearly before its time. Yes, way, well before its time. <laughs> so, you, so you could use the, uh, the, the Mio for something like a racing game or controlling a quadricopter or, as you said, presentations. Um, it's 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 exciting to see because the, like when when you have like a hardware manufacturer like this they know the broad verticals that they want to get into, um, but their hype videos their presentations are always uh, a little lacking because it takes that that third party like the developer community to really start uh, playing with it with fresh eyes and doing cool things with it. So I think with with these shipping now, the most exciting part is like seeing what developers do with it in the next three months. Right. Um, so this it should be noted that these are uh, these forty thousand pre-orders uh, at four at one hundred and forty nine dollars each, which is fairly reasonable. They're aimed at developers. They're not. This is not really meant uh, as a, a consumer device just yet. Even though it's the final production design is going to stay that way for when it ships in September. But as you said, this is really the second wearable that I can think of after Pebble, which also began as a sort of Canadian project uh, from Waterloo with the Impulse watch uh, that uh, Eric Mijikowski created for BlackBerry and then he expanded it uh, as one of the most successful Kickstarter projects ever to include iOS and Android. But the Pebble wasn't really that useful until developers started working on it, until they released an SDK and allowed people to tap into the potential of the hardware. So. I think you know we've seen great examples of how Mio or Mayo. How do you pronounce it? I actually tried to avoid doing it because I'm not really sure. Okay. Um, so but, you say Mio, I say Mayo. Perfect. But I think it's interesting that right now the potential use cases are pretty limited. I mean, we've seen it being used with Oculus Rift, with uh, a Parrot quadricopter, and those are amazing examples. But those are pretty myopic. Those are for products that not a lot of people are going to use. But if you think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, you could use this as a way to input text when you don't have access to, when, when you don't want to tap on a screen, for example. So we've talked about companies like Minuum before and how they initially uh, created this algorithm to input text using very forgiving um, autocorrect me mechanisms. And something like this could be used to create sentences and paragraphs and lots of other things just by moving your arm. Yeah, just through simple arm rotation um, on, on like one one uh, dimensional plane. Like, yeah, I think th there's there's a lot of cool things here. And uh, I think one of the one of the interesting things that they've just posted this week now that it's starting to ship is uh, on their blog they posted their the design evolution of this from prototype, the initial prototype, which looks like maybe a leather belt with some wires in it to what the what the final uh, production model is so it's it's worth checking out but I, I agree that it's it's really early days but this is something that you can see 
I think maybe because it is a, a wearable that creates a new control mechanism or a new input mechanism rather than it being a wearable that is purely about receiving information, that the, the potential there is a little bit more compelling, a little bit more interesting. Right. So it should be noted that the Mio is Bluetooth uh, enabled, so it can interact with any device that receives a Bluetooth signal and sends one back. And that makes it really versatile, so eventually it'll be used on smartphones, tablets, and other wearables, which could potentially uh, be quite interesting. But uh, I just want to read something uh, that, uh, that Stephen Lake, the CEO of Thelmix, said to Tom. He said, this is not going to be something that you wear every day. This isn't a smartwatch. This isn't a fitness tracker. This is meant to be a content-specific wearable, where you pick it up, you turn it on, and you wear it for interacting with certain objects. And that's very, very interesting because from a, from a user perspective, this is not trying to replace anything that you're currently wearing or currently using. This is not, you know, a, a fitness tracker replacement. This is a, a very specific piece of hardware that uh, developers will be able to augment uh, with their own software. Yeah, and, and content specific is a really interesting phrase because you could think of it more as, whereas with uh, the the wearables and what we've seen with Android Wear, we have Google talking about uh, uh, micro contextual information. With with the Mio armband, it's it's more content creation. You're using mm -hmm. it as input, so you're either going to not need it at all, or you're really going to love it for a specific use case. Which I think is, you know, as wearables evolve, you're going to see more of that, and it's 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 something easier to grasp onto than than say, okay, I've got this I've got this $150 smartwatch. Now what do I use it for? Right. So what I like about this is. Uh, you know, say I have I have a smartwatch like this. This has an IR blaster in it, but in order for me to interact with my computer or my TV, I actually have to scroll, tap, you know, start, stop, fast forward, rewind. Mm -hmm. With something like the Mio, you can squeeze your you know your fist to stop, and release your fist to resume, or move your arm slightly to the right to scrub forward and move it slightly back to scrub backwards. All of these things take very little motor control, and for people with disabilities, uh, this is going to be huge for accessibility. And I think that once developers figure out a way to implement this into iOS or Android, uh, especially with the iPad or a tablet, like a, a larger Android tablet, where you know tapping on the screen isn't really a possibility, uh, the potential for um, for accessibility on the Mio is is going to be outstanding. And I'm that's really where I'm. Uh, you know, I'm a huge proponent of, of smart devices as uh, as accessibility devices and ways to improve the lives of people with disabilities, and I think that this is going to be huge for that. Yeah, because it's not something that you're just trying to put another screen on. It's like it's completely new. I've seen I've seen the uh, the Thelmic guys use it to control a, a quadricopter, which was like enough to sell me. Oh, totally. Yeah. And for $150, I mean, anybody is going to be able to buy it. It's not going to be one of those Google Glass type situations where you have to hem and haul because it's $1,500 and you really don't know what the application's for. Yeah, although we should say that that price is for the dev model, so who knows what the finer, final consumer pricing is, but I would I would say right now that I'm more likely to purchase one of these than a smartwatch at this point. But, oh, yeah. Uh, do we want to move on and talk? There's some, uh, some big news. Another uh, Kitchener-Waterloo KW citizen had a fairly decent week in terms of uh, news and announcements. They did the big the big guy the uh, the the BlackBerry um, the OG the the OG the the OG rim itself um, they had a security summit in New York and as you've as you now love to point out BlackBerry really isn't a Waterloo based company anymore it's a New York based company because most of the execs live in the U S John Chen actually lives in Silicon Valley and he refuses to leave. So most conferences, uh, most announcements uh, from BlackBerry going forward are actually going to be in the U.S. and not in Waterloo. Well, it's it's also as they transition away from. I, I think you raise a totally valid point, but as they tr transition their their customer demographic away from broad consumers to uh, specific business verticals, especially focused on security, um, you're going to see them spending much more time in New York around Wall Street. 
um, in the financial district or in DC working with government and things like that and I think um, the two announcements that they had this week and a bit uh, obviously show that commitment right so uh, we what do you want to talk about first you want to talk about secure smart or Blackberry Guardian well I mean let's talk about the first acquisition that Blackberry Blackberry's made since they turned the corner uh, you know this is this has the potential to be as big as Cunix so Tell us about SecuSmart. I, I think that um, this is this is something that uh, has large implications for the company going forward. It's an anti-eavesdropping service that uh, it's a German company, and Angela Merkel, the the Chancellor of Germany, uses it to make sure that Obama is not spying on her because that's actually what happened. They discovered that the U.S. government was spying on uh, on the Chancellor. Um, so what what do you think? Is this just another another notch in the in the security belt for BlackBerry? Well, well your comment about the the impact of Cunix is interesting because as as you've seen, the Cunix acquisition hasn't actually really turned into something that's been revenue producing. Although it's like their long term platform play. I see something like uh secure uh SecuSmart being like an immediate impact upon on their business simply because they they are trying to build their security portfolio to sell in and the people already using the solution are the people that they're trying to sell uh, Black, Blackberry 10, Bez 12 and, and uh, the Passport to right so I think it's a it's a good sign that they are in a position to acquire um, and that they're, they're able to make those moves and I think it's a really smart pickup from them it, it completely falls in line uh, with what they're looking to do, um, and I guess if we, I don't know if we want to go into the details of just describing this, but this this is basically a solution that kind of sits in among the data transfer and like blo you want to say blocks any sort of uh, eavesdropping or uh, sniffing going on for the data. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that BlackBerry is going to disclose exactly how how it works because clearly that's a you know that's a security issue and a secu and, and a competitive advantage. But uh, we do know that the SecuSmart system basically detects for intruders in uh, in a data connection. So uh, as we know, both voice and data use uh, IP now to transfer. This is a over a like a digital network channel, and as a result, uh, there's a possibility for man in the middle. Snooping, uh, man-in-the-middle attacks, and uh, this basically sits in that intersection between two points or multiple points, and it makes sure that nothing that is not allowed in that data stream is listening in or trying to steal data. So it, I mean, BlackBerry is already doing this. Uh, a lot of what, um, a, a lot of their, the advantage of BlackBerry Internet service back in the day was to ensure that they knew exactly how data was traveling between your phone, their data network, and your friend's phone. And uh, as a result, they were thought to be the most secure company, uh, the most secure handset manufacturer in the world. Uh, now, Biz is no longer a thing. They're, they're more set, they send traffic over the wider internet. So a company like this monitors those connections, the wider internet connections that are not relying on a single uh, sort of highway between phone network and the internet in order to uh, in, in order to work. So uh, this is as even though we don't know the actual acquisition price that the, the amount that BlackBerry spent, I think that this is probably a very good thing for them. Yeah, and it should, so it should be said also that I think uh, BlackBerry's been working with Psyche Smart since two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Okay, I was going to say two thousand eight. Um, and just just based upon what we wrote up, so uh, already has customers in all the G seven governments, sixteen of the twenty G twenty governments, and ten out of the ten largest global enterprises in pharmaceutical, legal, automotive, uh, and oil and gas. So this is already something that's being used by these companies it, with with I, I guess triple A security requirements. The, what would be interesting though is with the acquisition, if if that's something that uh, BlackBerry pulls back on and then makes, you know, Bez Bez 12, Bez 10 only, as right. a as a as a security power play 
to right. really stake a claim. So um, not saying that they're going to do that, but it'd be interesting to see, you know, how they leverage this and and really make it more of a value add for for BlackBerry. But I I think we should maybe talk more a bit about BlackBerry Guardian. Um, yeah, that's just, the consumer side of this sort of anti malware, anti eavesdropping type of. Uh, of solution, right? Yeah, we, we, and I think so. It was a joint operation between BlackBerry and Trend Micro, uh, and something that they announced last year, like last winter-ish. Yeah. Um, and I guess the the whole idea here is that you know as BlackBerry's moved away from trying to provide its own uh, apps platform, the native apps platform. Uh, with its with its move to not only just more full throated support of Android apps, but then also uh, the loading of the Amazon App Store, uh, there's there's been just constant concerns with uh, the security of Android apps. So uh, what BlackBerry Guard a Guardian does is essentially, um, I guess, compares <laughs> uh, against a list it has of Android apps to alert you if any of those are malware, insecure, or if there are any issues. So I guess it's, it's, the, it's the compromise that BlackBerry kind of requires. If, if they're going to open up their platform and really rely upon Android while touting security, they're going to need that intermediary there to ensure that people, especially those who you know, are maybe more prone to, to, to try and sideload um, applications rather than download them directly from a store, uh, can, can trust that they're they're downloading only secure applications. Right. Okay. So let me let me just say this first and foremost: the Android malware problem is completely overblown. I mean, there are there's a billion apps out there for Android, and the amount of infection, the actual amount that that casual users get infected with malware is minute. It's like 0.01 percent. It's tiny. Trend Micro and other companies like McAfee, they realize that their market, their potential future market, is not on desktop. And it's, you know, like any other company that's scrambling to become mobile, the issue is that they have to convince people that mobile is insecure. How do they do that on iOS? They can't do that because iOS is very secure. It's, it's basically, it's sandboxed to the point where no apps can talk to one another unless you go through an Apple intermediary. And with iOS 8, that's still going to be the case, even though extensions exist. And once iOS 8 comes out, we'll get to that uh, in more depth. But Android is really the only operating system on, on a, you know, that's, a, that's a mobile platform that has any potential of being infected the way that Windows is so famous for. And I don't really think that there's a huge concern here with malware on Android. Um, sure, you can sideload an app onto BlackBerry, but by and large, the way that these apps work is that they they focus on the black the uh, Android kernel and uh, try to get into the boot process to try to steal data before the phone boots. Because once the phone boots, you actually have a lot of these security checks in place to ensure that uh, data is not being stolen or intercepted. Um, and BlackBerry is not an Android operating system. I mean, BlackBerry 10 is still uh, not Android native, and you're still going to be running all these Amazon apps in a in a window in a virtual window. So yeah. I don't know. I think BlackBerry Guardian is a great idea in theory for to ensure the comfort of old white men who own Blackberries and will be transitioning over to the Amazon App Store. But by and large, I don't actually think it's a it's it's a big necessity. Well, but if it's a if it's a necessity through perception, if it's the checkbox that allow check checkbox that allows them to say, hey, yeah, we we a lot of our apps are Android apps, Android Amazon apps, but we have BlackBerry Guardian. You're you're totally fine. And then we have, uh, I think, as they said, it's you know it's one part of a multi-layered strategy, um, and I I think it it helps them just from a messaging standpoint. A lot, you're seeing them consolidate around security uh, as their silver bullet in terms of what they can offer better than anyone else. And I, I think anything that aids um, from a, a, a technical, like actual feature perspective, but, but then also to reinforce that new uh, brand prop proposition is really important for them. So for sure. um, whether, or not, whether or not it actually does any good, if it's something that people know that they can rely on as a, as a fallback or 
it, it, it allows them to sell even a few more Vezna stalls and a few more devices, it's a win for them. Um, it is a win, and I, I, I also want to acknowledge that Google does the same thing already. They In 2012, they launched a server. At first, it was just a server-side check of new installs, but uh, since then, it's been updated to a server-side check of all installs, so instead of just checking a, an Android app when it's being installed on your phone, it now continually checks all the Android apps on your phone to ensure that they're free of malware. Uh, this is probably going to do the same thing. And look, it can't hurt. You're absolutely right. But uh, I think that they're making a bigger deal out of this than they need to. Okay. Uh, something that I want to make a really big deal out of um, that you don't want me to, but I think it's important to talk about is we've been hammering... Uh, on Samsung for a while on this podcast in a lot of different ways. Um, and I, I want... I, we have to talk at least a little bit about Samsung's interest in Tizen mm -hmm. and their inability to uh, effectively launch anything around it or build an ecosystem um, and, and what that means for the company. Yeah, so this week two things happen at Samsung. They announce their earnings and they announced that even though they sold a bajillion phones, the smartphone market is cooling, mm -hmm. which means that their hockey stick trajectory that uh, got them to the top of the Android game is now plateauing, and it's actually dropping. So unlike the iPhone, which continues to sell more and more units every quarter, Samsung cannot keep up its absolutely insane growth rate, especially at the high end where they make all their money. So obviously Samsung's trying to look at new ways to make money in the mobile space and they want to lessen their reliance on Google because when they don't have to adhere to Google's rules, they can then force developers and other manufacturers into uh, you know, taking, taking revenue from uh, in different ways. So for example, Samsung makes no money from the Google Play Store. Obviously Google takes that 30% cut from every app install uh, or, or every paid app or in-app purchase. Samsung wants that same benefit. They want to be able to sell you the hardware and the software the way that Apple does today. So how do they do that? Well they create Tizen. Now Tizen is actually based on their old Bada. Uh, it's, it's basically what happened to Bada when, they, when it got uh, when it got uh, shit can sure um, that you know that's not really it was never something that that Samsung thought would be a success in the market but Russia was actually where Bada launched and stayed and it, be it became relatively successful I mean it, it it was never you know Android level successful but it was it was okay it had a uh, footprint it had a re yeah I mean you know it sold a few hundred thousand units. And they even sold it in Canada as the, I believe, the Samsung Wave. That was back in, like, 2010, right when the Galaxy S launched, the original Galaxy S, and it was one of the first devices with a 4-inch non-pentile Super AMOLED display, which was crazy. Anyway, you going back into the, the memory Into mix. the vaults. So... <laughs> I may be wrong about that, but it was it had a it had a hardware advantage over the current Android phones at the time. But software-wise, it just it was terrible. There were no apps for it. So Tizen was supposed to be that way to bridge the gap, to make it easy for developers to port Android apps over to its platform, and to entice other developers to create HTML5-based apps. You know that could work potentially on multiple platforms. So if a developer was creating an app for Mozilla o or sorry Firefox OS, they could also make an app for Tizen because it was based on the same code base, right? It's HTML5, it's CSS, uh, you know, WebOS did this quite well, even though WebOS is dead. Very open source, or I, I guess... As open source as Google is, yeah, or as, yeah. as Android is. Um, so, so what happened, Doug? What, what happened to, uh, to the Galaxy Z, which was supposed to be the first Tizen phone launched in Russia? Well, so not, not only was it supposed to be the first Tizen phone, but we, I, this is a story that I've been covering basically since I started at Mobile Server. <laughs> oh, that's a phone on the floor. The phone on the floor. Okay, but it's not. It's not the whiskey. That's fine. No, the whiskey's not on the floor. The phone is on the floor. It's fine. So, so basically, since I started Mobile Syrup, I've been covering um, either Samsung announcements related to Tizen um, or announcements towards future announcements, as well as uh, delays. 
So we've seen, you know, Mobile World Congress in February was supposed to be their big ties and coming out party with a ton of partnerships, a ton of devices, uh, and it didn't happen. Uh, I think Orange pulled out. Uh, NTT Docomo, which is Japan's biggest um, mobile carrier, dropped out. Um, the devices weren't really there, weren't really shown. And although they've been able to get a few uh, wearable devices out running uh, a version of Tizen, as well as backport the original uh, gear smartwatch to Tizen, they haven't, haven't been able to get a device out. The uh, Samsung Z was a device launched, or announced, sorry, last month? In June sometime. And uh, a little over a month later, it's been put on indefinite hold so ties, uh, so Samsung can, quote, further enhance the ties and ecosystem. This was a device that was supposed to come out uh, before the end of the year in Russia. For them to announce a device and then basically uh, put it in the Deadpool or the indefinite hold pool uh, a month later shows that you know, I, I think one half of the company is really pushing for Tizen to happen because they see what's happening to their financials and how hard it is to be uh, a, a margin player building hardware in someone else's sandbox, mm -hmm. even though they're in a better position to do it than any other uh, Android OEM. Um, while another part of the company probably reasonably believes that there's no way that this is going to happen. There's just no market for a third or fourth, depending on where you want to count, say Windows Phone, uh, major OS platform, especially when they can't get uh, hardware manufacturers to buy in or can not release devices. Like Developers will not commit. I think the closest corollary you see is like, just the amount of effort Microsoft has put in to get high-end apps, like the AAA name apps uh, for Windows Phone, and how it's done so little to move the needle, despite an actual relatively small existing install base of Windows Phone devices, right? A couple of million every quarter being sold. Uh, no one's going to commit to Tizen if it can't get a device out in Russia. No matter how successful it is, and no, how many, no matter how many smartwatches they sell, and without developers on board or believing it's a real platform in any way, you, like they can't. There's there's a chicken and an egg thing here where they just there's no way they can build momentum. But um, so I would expect, you know, by the end of this year, if we don't see them really double down on Tizen, that like something's got to break or change because whatever strategy they had or whatever commitment they've shown so far has not worked out uh, in any measurable way. And I, I think it's also going to be even more problematic when Android Wear drops for real and no one shows any interest of participating in, in Tizen as a smartwatch platform. Because why would you when you have the Android for wearables right there? Right. Okay. So let's talk about why Samsung needs Tizen. Why do they actually want another platform? Is it because, as I said, they don't want to get see that developer money to Google? I don't think so. I don't really think that they need that extra revenue necessarily. I mean, the amount of money that Google or Apple makes from developers or from app downloads is pretty negligible. I mean, well, Apple... Just to be fair, though, like, so just taking a look at some of these numbers. So their net profits dropped 20% this last quarter. Uh, unit sales were down. Um, their revenue was down 10%, and their operating profit was down 25%. So... In a situation where you know it's not so much a matter of seeding revenue, but if you can, you always any technology company wants to control as much of the stack as possible. That's why Google has Android in the first place. That's why they don't care about hardware sales because they own the platform. It enables them to do so many other things. Samsung is the company um, best set up to capitalize on a like a full spectrum hardware production system from like from flat screens all the way down to the most minuscule piece of hardware right you did down to the like the chip level if they right. can't if they can't break out they're always going to be in a margins battle in a pricing battle with other companies who are going to try and do it faster and cheaper so they're they're looking for 
an ecosystem, sustained sustained revenue outside of their hardware production capabilities. There's no such thing as an ecosystem for Samsung other than Android today. They have invested too much time in building up the Galaxy line to just throw it away, and they're never going to do that. They still sold, they still made like $51 billion in revenue. They still sold like 75 million smartphones. I mean, this is still an enormous company built on the back of Android, and Tizen is not going to fix that. They're not going to just come out of nowhere with Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and every other important app that people rely on every day. And they understand that. I mean, that's the reason BlackBerry, you know, basically gave up the ghost. And that's why Windows Phone has struggled so much, because aside from marketing issues, which Windows Phone clearly has, you know, they're basically at feature parity with Google, with iOS and Android in most other respects, but they just don't have the ecosystem to support it. And it's a two-horse race, and Tizen, I mean, leaving aside North America for a moment, because we know that Tizen would never, ever, ever work in North America. It, it, it's, it's, there's no way it would, it would just even come close. That's why Symbian never really got a foothold here. But if Tizen was, if you were able to offer a near equivalent experience as Android for half the cost on a Samsung branded smartphone in Russia or in India or in the Philippines or Singapore or Taiwan where the market the, the market can't support eight nine hundred dollar phones then maybe it has a chance and that's why they were launching in Russia because Samsung's uh, dominance with Android in Russia is not the same as its dominance of Android in the U in uh, the U.S. in Germany and France and Spain, and they just they, they have that opportunity. But I get that. But so then, why then, with even that meager or modest objective, are they unable to do that? Or what what strategically, in the in essentially the same quarter, what leads you to announce a device release, and then can it a month later? That's well, that's a schizo it. It's well, okay. They're not canning it, but. When you delay something, you generally don't delay it indefinitely. <laughs> like that's especially a month after announcing it. That's that's a schizophrenic uh, way of operating your business. If this is important to you, you're absolutely right. But here's the thing: Samsung is not one organization the way that not Google, but maybe Apple would be. You know, yes. they have dozens of subsidiaries often working on independent projects. I mean, you and I went to see that Samsung smart home. Mm -hmm. The company that creates all of that hardware, Samsung SDS, is a completely independent entity than Samsung itself. Samsung actually licenses the, due to the limitations of the basically Korean corporate law, they have to be completely independent compared to a company like Apple, which can keep everything in one place where every single department can talk to one another. You know, because Samsung is so huge that there's antitrust issues around monopolies and, you know, competitive advantages and stuff. So obviously Samsung can buy components from its various verticals, Samsung Chemical and Samsung Display and Samsung whatever. But, you know, Tizen, as far as I know, is being independently developed to Android, and they they needed this in order to try to wean themselves off of reliance on Google. But on the other hand, it could be that they're using it as a as a you know a tool to leverage, or as a, as a way to to build leverage for Google to to say, okay, well we don't need you as much because you know we have our own thing going on, and then Google would say, well clearly you don't. Well, we did report that story this past week where apparently Samsung's infatuation with Tizen had been pissing Google off a bit. But I don't know if it's leverage so much as, like, you have to have leverage to use leverage, and you need to sell Tizen devices to get it. So, And I completely agree with you. You're totally right. Um, Samsung is not one company. Um, I We've talked about this before. I, I feel that Samsung uh, is repeating or reliving Sony in the late 90s and early 2000s, and and that kind of existence where you have this major uh, multi-headed hardware manufacturer struggling to exist beyond that. So, all that said, do you have any confidence that we'll actually see Tizen devices out in the wild 
this year, or B, that Tizen will have any impact for Samsung or in the mobile market? Yes, but never for smartphones. Smartphones, uh, the, the Samsung smartphone ecosystem is Android, and it will always be Android. I don't think they could ever change that now. They're too far, di they're too deep in the hole, and they've invested far too much in the Galaxy brand and the Android ecosystem. And too many people associate Android with Samsung. And the thing is, if, if Samsung then replaced Android with the Tizen and didn't tell anybody like they did with the with, with the uh, their Gear Live or their Gear Watches, and all of a sudden people turn on their phone and they couldn't get Instagram and they couldn't get Facebook and they couldn't get Twitter, people would go nuts. I, I mean that's the reality of the situation is that people don't care if it's Android or Tizen. They just want Spotify and RDO and Songza and everything else that they are used to on Android. And if they can't get them and developers aren't willing to build those apps for Tizen, then they're screwed, and they're going to continue to 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 basically fall behind Apple in in the ecosystem race. Okay, so then if it's not smartphones, what is it? Because I it's don't think wearables. It's wearables. So it has then, to be. So then explain to me why wearables is more compelling when Android or when Google has basically extended Android out in the wearable space, so that it's it's almost plug and play interoperability. With the current Android offering, like okay. how how do they how do you how do they get leverage in the wearable space when Android's there in a few months? Well, they do it by bundling, and they do it by offering a better experience than Android Wear on across all Android devices. So let me give it to you in a way that I've actually discovered in the last week. Yes, I, explain it to me like I'm a small child because I need this. Okay, so I got a GS5 and I hooked up both the Gear Live, which is Samsung's Android Wear uh, smartwatch, yeah. and the Gear 2 Neo, which is their Tizen-based Samsung smartphone-only smartwatch that came out with the GS5. Mm -hmm. So this the experience with the Neo is actually better than Android Wear because what they've done is they've worked with the hardware to create what's called a trusted device. So if I'm wearing my... Neo on my watch, on my wrist, it works with my Android phone to determine whether I'm nearby and unlocks the, it keeps my phone uh, security low. Once I step away from my smartphone or my, my watch, then I can't use that trusted security anymore and I have to, I have to use a, a PIN or a, a, you know, a, a passcode of some sort. Android Wear is far too broad. It, it appeals to every single Android device and therefore cannot work specifically with hardware like the Samsung Galaxy S4, like the 5, to optimize the experience. And that's what Samsung's going for. It's, it's, it's a platform play. They're saying the Gear Live is going to be great for anybody who has an Android phone, but the Gear 2 and the Gear 2 Neo are specifically built for the Samsung Galaxy S5 and the experience is going to be far better as a result. That's not entirely true. I still like the Android Wear platform for many ways, it, 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 for many other things. But there are examples of Tizen working better with the Galaxy S5 because they have that that software stack that Android Wear just can't have. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually think that it, it it's working in their favor. And Tizen is far less battery intensive. I mean, in my Wear review, I talked about how you rarely get more than a day out of the uh, the Gear Live. I've gotten two and a half days already out of this Gear 2 Neo, and I'm still going strong. So, I mean, there is that. So, but does, the, but does that allow them to really convince any other wearable manufacturers to jump to Tizen or to convince uh, Android app developers to make Tizen versions, wearable Tizen versions of their Android apps for interoperability? Like, can they well, get no. to that stuff? I mean, that's that's... The, that's the same problem that they have with Tizen on, on smartphones, is that they're, they're going to have a hard time convincing developers, especially now that Android Wear is a reality, and all developers need to do is basically add in a few lines of code to optimize their apps for Android Wear. Samsung's going to continue to struggle to do the same for Tizen. So, no, I, I, I think Tizen is dead in the water. The only, the only hardware play they currently have is in, in wearables, but even then, it's pretty slim pickings. So, okay. 
I don't know. I, I think I, I don't I don't see it lasting any more than a couple more years. All right, then sell me on something that you are very excited about and that I have like I don't care at all right now. So I'm I'm interested to see your pitch. Talk to me about Alcatel One Touch. Cuz cuz this is something that like you've been like like making some noise about this in in the mobile syrup back channels um our chat up. Uh and I, I want you, you, you quote, called them today, uh, they're like a well-oiled Chinese OEM machine. So defend that, sir. Okay, so let me give you some background. Alcatel OneTouch is uh, owned by TCL, which is a Chinese hardware manufacturer. They basically, they used to build devices the way that, uh, they, it's basically, they used to, Take all the components, the individual components of a smartphone, build it, and ship it. They were they were just a vendor, and then they decided to buy Alcatel's up and coming uh, smartphone division, and they're now calling it Alcatel One Touch. Uh, they just launched a couple devices in Canada: uh, the Idle 2S on Bell, the Idle X Plus on Telus, the Idle, uh, the Pop 8 on Telus as well. So a, a, a mid-range smartphone, a, a entry-level smartphone, and a mid-range tablet. The reason I'm excited about Alcatel is they're the, the only hardware manufacturer that doesn't skimp on on quality uh, on, on, on quality external hardware uh, and is still able to use their um, their economies of scale to offer carriers devices at much lower prices than Samsung or LG. So. The the mid, the high end Alcatel One Touch devices are still going to cost only four, maybe three hundred and fifty four hundred dollars, whereas the same you know Samsung device would cost seven eight hundred dollars. Now a few years ago that would be an an issue because Android because the the components themselves weren't powerful enough. So a high end Android phone from Samsung would be far better performing than a, like a high end smartphone from Alcatel One Touch. But today there's been so much commoditization of the, of of uh, hardware. Uh, companies like MediaTek are creating systems on a chip or SOCs that have pretty high performing uh, yeah. CPUs and GPU combos. And it's more about how cheaply you can source and um, compile all the individual parts than really doing anything custom, right? Right. So you have a device like the Alcatel one touch idle x plus which is a terrible name but it's going to cost like $350 outright $0 on a 2 year contract which people like they don't like paying for phones because mm -hmm. that's what that's how the carriers have have uh, warped their brains and educated them so you have phones that are actually uh, competitive with high end devices from Samsung and LG and HTC at bargain basement prices and they're inevitably going to bring the prices of handsets down and that's what we need in Canada. Okay, bringing bringing the prices down while not skimping on the quality in the way that, uh, say, HTC is trying with the, uh, oh, what you call it, the uh, the plastic version of the uh, the M8. one M8. So yeah. it's called the E8. Yeah, exactly. But what's so interesting about this is, say, the Idle 2S is launching on Bell. It's going to be uh, zero dollars on a two-year contract and three hundred dollars outright. What makes it interesting is that is not that you save money on the outright purchase, but that because it's in a different category as, say, the iPhone or the Galaxy S5 or whatever, you actually don't need a data plan to buy the phone. You can buy it for $300 outright without spending $60, $70 a month, and then you can go and unlock the phone and move to another carrier if you want, or you can save a lot of money on getting a cheaper plan at Bell because the stipulations in so signing a contract are not as rigid because the carriers because OEM OEMs like Alcatel are not they're, they're not set on convincing consumers that they are a top tier manufacturer with all of those rules and regulations to carriers so the carriers are using OEMs like Alcatel to bring the to to basically make negotiating easier for a div for uh, when, when they're when they're um, negotiating costs on a yeah. high-end Samsung. So like you, there is a company with a lot of the hardware capabilities of a Samsung, but without any of the aims of being uh, a flagship in your face 
uh, brand so they can just worry upon delivering at the right like so this is the thing that keeps Samsung up at night because they you know uh, they can't be Google and they can't be Alcatel like this is this is a problem for them so you said we're gonna be getting in the the idle 2s shortly yeah so I'm interested in getting your impressions uh, after on this to see if like if it if it really equates to a holistic experience that's noticeably better. So I did review the first Alcatel device that launched in Canada, the Idol X on Bell earlier this year, and in the review I said that it's really nice hardware. It's a, it had a beautiful five-inch 1080p screen, but it skimped in areas where. Uh, Th that they shouldn't have skipped in the in the CPU area. Mm -hmm. With the Idol X Plus, it's a it's a slightly faster uh, system on a chip, so it's better performing. But it's also running Android KitKat, which is optimized for devices with slower yeah, hardware. It's better performance. So we, we have, as you said, a holistic experience that's going to be better across the board, and that's why devices like the Moto G, the Moto E, um, devices from Huawei. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oppo and and Xiaomi and all these other low cost manufacturers, those are the co the companies that are eating into Samsung's market share. So we just reported this yesterday. You actually wrote this story that uh, Huawei, Lenovo, they're eating into Samsung's market share. They they were actually the only companies to gain smartphone market share in uh, in the last quarter, mm -hmm. and Samsung lost market share in that same period. Yeah. So this is this. This is a big problem. It's funny that, uh, or maybe we planned it this way, that um, <laughs> the talking about what S Samsung's trying to do only speaks to, you know, you got to protect your corner any way you can. Um, and I think the way that they're going about it isn't going to work. Meanwhile, you know, you can have these smaller companies uh, who haven't really had a presence in North America nipping at their heels. So, and to be honest, the, uh, the Idol 2S, even the Idol X, it's got a, it's 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 a cute little phone. Like it doesn't, it looks it looks nice. It's yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see how it turns out. Um, I might even I might even steal it from you for a few days. Yeah, but you're you're gonna hate it. So. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I might break it. Just pure Android frustration. So okay, uh, keeping in mind that we promised a shorter podcast, uh. And keeping in mind our our levels of frustration when we talk about things like this, we've been we've been teasing the uh, the pricing plan stuff for a while, mm -hmm. and we're we're at kind of at the end of our, our news stuff. Do we wanna do we wanna just like swing at it and see how it goes, or do we do we tease it for another week like the no like look I, I the episode where we just <laughs> talk until the end and then no fights happen. Uh oh, Dragon Ball Z. Shout out to Dragon Ball Z. Um. No, look. I want to talk about it briefly because you okay. know this is this is not changing anytime soon. Um, you know, it's it's frustrating to me that share plans have inevitably increased the price that Canadians pay because they bundle voice and text in with uh, in with their data. So the way that that the way that uh, these share plans work, and and they were a result of the two-year contract change that the wireless code of conduct necessitated. The way it works now is that you you spend a certain amount of money per person on your account per month mm -hmm. for an unlimited voice and text plan. So uh, if you if you want to buy a high-end phone like an iPhone or a Galaxy S5, you spend $60 up front, and that gets you unlimited voice and unlimited, unlimited text. And that's Canada-wide, right? That's Canada-wide, wherever you are, wherever the service is offered. So for the incumbents, it means that if I live in Toronto, I can go to Vancouver and I can call somebody in Vancouver, or I can call somebody back in Toronto, it doesn't matter. It's still local. Same with texting, MMS. You get unlimited. You get uh, voicemail, call display. All those things that you used to pay for as a separate add-on are now included in the plan. That's good, right? It, it, in theory, it sounds good. And then you move over to the third column, which shows the final tally of the price, and you, you want to keel over. Right, because it starts at eighty dollars for what what you what would have been basically half that price just two years ago, um, which gives you five hundred megabytes of data. Now, we're not going to call this collusion because we can't really say that. And slander laws in Canada are specific, so. <laughs> <laughs> but let's I mean let's call a spade a spade. The fact that Rogers Bell and Telus 
offer the exact same share plan prices is pretty suspect. And that's something that our readers have brought up every single time we write about these companies. But it's also something that other new entrants like Win WinMobile, Mobilicity, Videotron, they always bring up, that these companies don't seem to compete on price. The other thing that I find really frustrating is that once you get that amount of money that you're spending on voice and data, or voice and text, rather, the amount you spend on data does not really scale properly. So let's let's give you an example. When you sign up for a smartphone plan and you have three people in your account, you then get to share data between those three people, right? Yes. So each person is spending $60 a month for unlimited voice and text. Mm -hmm. And then you spend $20 for 500 megabytes of shareable data, $25 for one gigabyte of shareable data, $30 for two gigabytes of data, $50 for four, 65 for six, 85 for 10, and 105 for 15. That is an absurd scale. That just does not make sense. That's that's the price of like the older plans. Yes. In total, like like uh, data and and voice, which is which is the most and also the not only just in the the per dollar data amount, but where they've decided the caps are going to be, like where where the plan levels are, like where they start with this. Um, you know, like it, it puts you in a point where for me to get equivalent service or just equivalent data, sorry, equivalent data, um, assuming that I am uh, a bachelor with two cats and no reason to share data with anyone because I live a sad existence uh, writing about mobile technology in Canada, I'm looking at upping my current $90 bill to $125 a month for unlimited messaging, which doesn't matter because I only send texts to no one because, hey, welcome to WhatsApp, and unlimited Canadian-wide calling, which I already get through Roger's one number um, before six, and then I have my evenings and weekends free. So they're now charging me 30 more dollars a month for absolutely nothing. Right. So they justify this by saying that the prices have to go up because they need to maintain the same revenue over two years that they were getting for three years. In fact, you're actually giving them more money in most cases over two years than you were over three years, which is pretty crazy because if they wanted to equalize it, they would just make you pay the same amount over two years that you were paying over three years. Uh, but they're not. You're actually paying more. But what's what's what doesn't make sense is that, as you said, for individuals, this is not a good deal. Sure, you can sh you can share your data between a phone and a tablet and or two tablets or whatever you want, but really, you're not going to be saving much money, especially for people who don't really use voice calls anymore. And that's really what it comes down to: is that the carriers know that voice ARPU, or average revenue per user, has been dropping precipitously. People are not making as many phone calls as they used to. Instead, they're replacing that usage with data, with WhatsApp, with uh, browsing the web, with playing games and downloading and whatever else you do using data connections. They know that the, the new hot commodity is data. And even though they're not actually charge, they're, they're not constantly... Um, upgrading their services, even though they claim they are. And, and they, to some extent, they are. I mean, Canada's a big country. They're constantly investing in, in new towers and whatnot, but it's not yeah, the yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. This is where I get ranty. So I, I, one thing that you're not I, we're addressing here with this, and this is where I'm, the rage is starting to build up. It's, it's feeling good now. It's, I, it feels like home. Is it, Not only is it terrible for an individual who has no use for voice and you know they have a they have a I understand the need to transfer their their return from from voice to to data they're basically forcing every teenager in a family that's currently using a cheap wind phone to now go on the Rogers family plan because it's the only way mom and dad are going to justify spending any money on this stuff like it these these plans only make sense if you have your whole or, or are only um, tolerable if you have your own family on the plan sharing a meager amount of data. There's like there's there's no way 
that as a as a as a mother or father of a family of like three or four, that I'm going to allow anyone in the family to <laughs> diverge from the family plan, just just to lower lower the total cost of use. Like so, the the kids getting their uh, their cheap win plan. Uh, uh, or or going with uh, kudo or whatever, like it's it's not happening. We're all going on the Rogers plan because I'm just looking to divide up uh, the data amount. Right. So that's the thing is that data is really the only commodity that matters anymore, and being forced to pay for voice and text that's not fair. First and foremost. Second of all, most people do not share their plans. Rogers Valentel is like, well, then find some friends who do, but you can't do that because everybody on the account has to be at the same address. That's the second issue. Third issue is that they don't scale properly. It's not fair that they charge $25 for one gigabyte and $50 for four gigabytes. How does that work? Fourth, or third, or whatever, most people want to unbundle their smartphone costs from their plans. So for example, you, pe you spend $60 up front only when you buy a high-end smartphone but you spend $50, at least on Rogers you do, when you buy a low-end phone. That's independent of their data. So, for example, uh, if you bring your own device, if I go out and I buy a Nexus, I spend $40 uh, to bring my phone per month on TELUS, but I spend $50 on Rogers and $45 on Bell. So that's really the only variance in pricing. All, all other aspects of these carrier prices are identical across the board. And what, what really frustrates me is that they're calling this value because they take for granted that people don't necessarily use their data that much. Rogers, Bell, and Telus insist that the average Canadian only uses about 1.2 gigabytes of data per month. Do, do you believe that? <sighs> well, that's a, low, that's a whole other podcast question, but I, I, I don't... Let me say that I would take anything that they're publicly saying about data usage and the what their customers think and feel with a grain of salt. Um, and and I think we should talk about you know the what the average Canadian user is because I think those numbers will also be skewed a lot by just the the need like are they counting pure cellular data or Wi-Fi usage, total usage, um, things they can't measure. But I want to go back to the competition thing because uh, we didn't say collusion because slander, but um, I can see how, th how certain carriers in the position that they are, say the big three, would uh, look at their current pricing models, which were all the same previously, um, look at an opportunity because of the changing Canadian law to institute uh, family sharing bundles, which leverage their desire to maximize the monetary return of every family. So they're not going after individuals, they're trying to get them all in one go. What I can't believe is that they would have no desire to compete with each other in any way on price. Because because they don't have to. That's that's the most frustrating thing. Because not, none of the carriers are offering any other differentiation. Other like other than color and maybe customer service of you know of which is a varying circles of hell there's there's you know our previous conversation I was, I was going back listening to old podcasts and our podcast maybe two weeks ago uh, yeah I listened to our old podcast Amazing. We're, we were talking about the need for um, and the government mandated need for a fourth major do you feel in any way that this bullshit's going to change okay before so before we have a fourth major or if we do okay so what happened today with uh, so to give you a bit of background, the CRTC came down on Rogers uh, for entering into exclusive domestic roaming agreements with companies like WinMobile, Mobilicity, Videotron, uh, and and some others. And what they said was that in doing so, in in asking these companies to uh, not go out or not be allowed to go out and negotiate other roaming deals with incumbents like Bell or Telus that they were preventing these new entrants from offering competitive domestic roaming rates. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they're basically keeping prices high because these companies like Wind and Mobilicity can't offer competitive national uh, or an equivalent national network at the same prices as Rogers, Bell, and Telus. And that's true because right now, 
wind is very cheap in its own home areas, but if you roam outside, not only do you not get 3G data, but when you do get any data at all, it's insanely expensive. So this could be the, the first in many changes that the government is going to enforce in domestic roaming. And as a result, just like they did for Tech Savvy and, and Alca, or, uh, Akanak and other cable and DSL providers, if Wynn's finally going to be able to say, okay, we are going to give you unlimited 3G data in all the big cities that we operate, and we can provide you with unlimited 3G data on one of our carrier partners, whether it's Rogers, Bell, or TELUS, and they're able to negotiate good prices now as a result of this change in other areas of the country where we don't offer any network, then we can say, okay, we're going to give it to you for $20 a month more. That is a huge difference from what they are offering today, and it's actually going to make a big difference in, uh, I think, the pricing of uh, the incumbents. Okay, so in in your uh, report today, uh, which you got up wicked fast right before we went to pod, uh, which is quite impressive. Uh, I think I think the thing at the end that is most interesting to me beyond what you just said was that the fact that there's going to be a public hearing on the competitive state of the wireless market in late September. So you. You can bet dollars to donuts that mobile syrup will be represented at that public hearing, if not as a participant, as a member of the audience and the press, and that we will be telling all of our readers uh, when and where that is so that they can look to voice their concerns. Because if, if this is the CRTC, as you said, taking maybe a wait-and-see approach, but looking to open a wedge for change that is meaningful or at least not terribly depressing and frustrating, it's it's our responsibility as mobile surf writers and you as listeners who care about this stuff uh, way more than people rationally should to participate because otherwise it's not going to get any better. Right. So I think what they're and they're they're going to end up regulating domestic roaming rates. That I think that's a given. I just I think that they're trying not to disadvantage companies like Satel or MTS uh, where. They've built up and they've spent billions of dollars building up regional networks over the last, you know, however many years. And they don't want to have Rogers, Bell, and Telus come in and say, oh, well, if you're going to be regulating domestic roaming rates, then we don't have to build up anything in Manitoba or Saskatchewan. But by the way, give us really cheap rates on domestic roaming there uh, because now we can claim that we have a full national network uh, even though we couldn't before. So I think that's where the issues lie. I think that this will happen. It's just a matter of going through the motions, and the CRTC makes a recommendation to the government. The government then changes the Telecommunications Act, and it's a slow-moving ship, but it will happen, and I think Wind is going to be able to say, and I think Tony Lacabera hinted at this at the beginning of the summer, that uh, they will be able to offer unlimited 3G domestic roaming mm -hmm. across Canada for, uh, I think, a set amount, maybe 20 bucks a month extra, but it's going to happen. So on that note, I, I do think that, you know, we can, all of us, both you and I agree and all of us listening, that prices in Canada are too much reflected on uh, this, they're, they're reflected. The prices are too damn high. <laughs> they're, they're reflected too much on the U.S. market, which I think is not a good indicator of wireless pricing in the world. And, uh, you know, we, we reported on that wall report earlier this month, and I think that was a good indicator of the U.S. is not the right partner to be comparing our prices to, because even they spend way too much on roaming, or on uh, on wireless. So, yes, things suck, but things are probably going to get better, and I think that's the conclusion we, we can make today. That's a great way to end a podcast. So, if you're still listening, and uh, we hope you are, thank you so much for joining us. We're, um, we're going to be back next Thursday, and... Uh, we're going to do this every Thursday, and hopefully Jane will join us next week. Uh, as usual, Douglas, thank you so much for giving us your your beautiful face and your your lovely insights. My, my new headset and my anger. Make sure to uh, subscribe to the podcast if you can on iTunes. Write a review. Uh, share it with friends. Keep giving us more feedback. We've gotten a lot of uh, a distaste for the audio, so we're trying to fix that. Let us know. Uh, other things we can improve upon, topics you want to see. Do you like this new streamlined, kind of close to an hour podcast, or would you rather we just go 
for six hours and see who collapses first. Uh, let us know. Leave a comment. All right. Well, uh, on that note, thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.